David Lynch's 2001 classic Mulholland Drive has perplexed audiences since its release. I had the pleasure of watching it in a small community cinema last night and still to this day the flood of people leaving the cinema asking their friends what the fuck just happened is intoxicating. Lynch has always been known as an enigmatic and offbeat director for his perplexing and idiosyncratic storytelling. Unlike the precise and methodical storytelling of a director like Nolan, Lynch has prided himself on taking an untraditional approach towards his complicated narrative arcs. He's famously cagey about explaining his work. L elaborate on that. No. I won't. <laughs> but one of the greatest insights I've ever seen into his work was with the oddball himself. And uh, the green was coming out of the black. And I suddenly saw the green start to move a little and I heard a wind. And I thought, uh, this is um, beautiful. And I thought maybe the paintings, you know, should move some. So I got the idea to do an animated film of a moving painting. And it wasn't at all, it was an experiment, really. Every, every year at the Academy, they had an experimental painting and sculpture contest. And I built this thing on a sculptured screen and um, an animated film loop that would repeat itself and as an experiment. So uh, it was an experiment though that opened the door to me and uh, that started everything rolling. Films are not constant, they're 24 frames a second, 24 paintings a second and no director I've ever seen has come as close to the mastery Lynch has with the individual brushstrokes that make up the final moving painting. In particular, Lynch exquisitely paints the disassociation and fever dreams of the failing actress in Mulholland Drive. I've always had an unwavering passion for Mulholland Drive in particular. Every viewing has felt as electric as the last. From my first foray into Lynch with friends to a crowded cinema, no matter how well I've come to know the scenes that are playing before me, one thing has never wavered, the atmosphere that sensually dark and electric atmosphere that Lynch has seemingly mastered. I wondered why it has always captivated me so many viewings deep until I remembered. Lynch is a painter, not a director. The plot of Mulholland Drive has been universally defined for years now, with the traditional reading being that Diane, a jitterbug contest winner, moved to LA in the hopes of becoming a movie star. Her career never took off and her love for a fellow actress Camilla blindsided her to the narcissistic underbelly of Hollywood. Losing both her heart and her career to Camilla, who sleeps with her director to get ahead, Diane goes into a downward spiral before paying a seedy hitman to murder her. Breaking under the guilt, Diane seeds into a disassociative fever dream and eventually commits suicide. Whilst everything in the film outside of Diane's dream serves the greater purpose of context, it isn't until the last 20 minutes of the film that we receive this information. The true beauty of Mulholland Drive comes in Lynch's exploration of Freud's wishful thinking theory and the genius of exploring that through the lens of a painter. In 1900, Freud wrote the book The Interpretation of Dreams. He argued that guilt in your active life could serve as a repressor through which your dreams would take on wish fulfillment. It's without a doubt in my mind that Mulholland Drive acts out as Diane's own wish fulfillment, and it isn't the first time which Lynch has used the medium to explore Freud's work. The cowboy's almost godlike demeanor is no accident. He's intentionally of a higher function than Adam, and whilst he's attached to the Hollywood studios in the narrative, serves in my mind more as the super ego of Diane. After telling Adam that he will see him twice more if he does bad, Diane experiences just that. The cowboy wakes her up and then seemingly walks past her vision at the party. After all, as we come to learn, she has done bad. Yes, he's talking to Adam about this, but Adam is just as much of an extension of Diane's wish fulfillment as everything else in the film is. In her dreams, he's a failing director who's had his career taken away from him as Diane does. His wife has cheated on him like Camilla cheats on Diane, and he also goes broke like Diane. Everything within the film plays into the hands of Freud's theory. Noticeably, when Betty calls Diane Selwyn's apartment for Rita, she says, it's weird calling yourself. While she says this in relation to Rita, she is indeed calling herself. Likewise, in the club Silencio, 
the illusion of her dream is shattered through a repressed rendition of Lorando, a Spanish song about the hardships of unrequited love. Whilst the song isn't in her native tongue, her mind repressing the trauma is still too much for Betty and causes her to go into shock and ultimately at the end of the scene leave her dream. I'd always been puzzled about the meaning of the Silencio sequence, but through the lens of Freud's wish fulfillment, it plays out as a sequence about the power of illusion, its wish fulfillment incarnate, even knowing, even being told it's not real, you still latch onto the vivid emotions and vicariously live through them. The singer's performance is so powerful that you can't help but fall into the trap, and then when it is whisked away, taken so abruptly, noticeably by her falling asleep, you feel cheated. Universally known as the dream logic man, I think people don't give Lynch's unique position credit. He's a painter, and his scenes are approached from a place of emotion and abstract impressionism rather than a straightforward explanation of what's happening. We're meant to feel our way through the film and understand it later, and I think that's why still to this day a screening of the film draws a packed cinema. Mulholland Drive's first sequence establishes Lynch's intentions for the rest of the film, a nonsensical backlot reproduction of a jitterbug contest with images layered over each other is a startling entrance and whilst you're unsure of what you're truly seeing, one thing is for certain, you're watching a collage. As more and more images are laid on top of each other, the essence of a dream begins to unfold, a collage of dances, fanciful expressions of energy, brush strokes of passion, all leading to a greater meaning. It lays the groundwork for the film as scenes are layered on top of one another with no context, no explanation and no immediate intention. Simply collages of emotion and feelings, the middle of the dance and the middle of the dream. Our first visit to Winkies finds us sat with two suits, a complete departure from the story and tone of the characters we've been introduced to, two almost identityless men, one of them begins to talk about a dream that he's had. He's been sitting in this diner talking to this man, and an evil lurks outside in the back alley. As the scene so delicately glides along, nothing out of the ordinary occurs until you and this man realise that you're both stuck within the dream. No cuts, no immersion breaks, you're here and you know the ending. Realising he's stuck, he stands, walking towards his fate, the end of his dream as if on rails, unable to escape, unable to run. He and the audience must confront the dark truth lurking in the back alley of Winkies. Practically gliding towards the alley, he begins to sweat, terrified that the dark truth is real, until... It is. Ostensibly, the scene serves no purpose in the film. It's not until we learn that the hitman Diane hired would leave a key behind the same Winkies to confirm the murder of Camilla that it comes into focus. Only then, when the context is provided, do the feelings of terror within this man make sense. It's an extension of Diane's psyche, projecting her remorse onto a random man she saw in the same Winkies, feeling trapped in a nightmare, unable to stop herself from changing the truth, the dark truth of murder hiding away in the back alley. So why are the scenes so far apart? Why is one at the beginning and one at the end? Because the explanation isn't important until the dark reality is revealed. Like Diane, we're hiding. We, like her, lurk in the beautiful dreamy skyline of the Hollywood fantasy until the cracks start to show and the dream must come to an end. Films are fantasy, they're dreams, collages of emotions and delusions intended to wash us away from the reality of life. Lynch doesn't explain himself, he simply paints a picture, one more vivid than any painting can be, a terrifying dreamlike collage of images that slowly begins to crack as it comes to an end. Every film, like every dream, must end and as Diane vicariously dreams through the void Winkies man, she must too eventually confront that dark alley and wake up to the bleak reality of her actions. Like his brushstrokes of imagery, Lynch also applies his painter's hand to his dreamlike score, divinely created alongside his longtime musical partner Angelo Badalamenti. Angelo! Oh, that's tearing my heart out. I love that. Just keep that going. Now she's starting to leave. 
Lynch builds thematics where there is ostensibly nothing, emotion leading the way. In my favourite scene of the film, Betty is taken to an audition for Adam's new film. Having been told he is to cast Camilla Rhodes, Betty arrives mid-audition. A real set, the magic of Hollywood flows from the picture. Having proved her immense ability to act in the previous scene, her ambition and opportunity is high. She's here for this role and she deserves it. After all, in this dream, she's the movie star. 16 Reasons by Connie Stevens swoons across the room, its dreamlike spacing only pierced by the clarity of Stevens' voice. 16 Reasons Why I Love You. Gazes are held between Adam and Betty. She and he know that Betty's the lead actress, that she should be there when action is called. The chemistry between them is undeniable even from a glance until she must leave. Betty's late, her love and care for Camilla pushes her away from her career. Betty is faced with staying for her career or leaving for Camilla. She holds one last stare with Adam before choosing Camilla, choosing love. Again, like Winkies, the true power of this scene doesn't come into action until further images in the collage are revealed. As Diane sits for dinner at Adam's, Camilla's choice is revealed brutally in front of her. Camilla has chosen her career over love. She, now engaged to Adam, clearly doesn't love him. She kisses somebody else at the table and laughs manically with Adam over the engagement. She's destroyed Diane's heart for her own gain. It's, it's a horrifying counterpiece to Diane choosing love over Adam and her career, and it exemplifies Lynch's approach to the story. Scenes are about the emotion as they are happening, the brushstroke as it is being painted. Only when everything has been revealed can those emotions be put together to create meaning. Mulholland Drive is about the brushstrokes, not the painting. Each splash of paint laced with thematic meaning and emotion, whether it be the final reveal of illusion at Club Silencio or the idiosyncratic humour of a failing hitman, Lynch's film, like Diane's dream, is about the feeling and process. Only when you step back and wake up from the fantasy does the full image finally come into focus. It's a journey, or as Freud argued, wish fulfilment. When reality does not work out the way we expected and the darkness of our decisions begin to leak into our subconscious, we, like Diane, slip away into our dreams to find what we couldn't find in real life, to fix our mistakes and to realize our fantasy. No sense, no grand complicated plan, just vivid brushstrokes of life laced with emotion and atmosphere.